orthopedic surgeon Kochi. He's a good friend. He has, uh, he has had advanced Elizabeth Fellowship under Professor Maurizio Catagni from Italy. And he has a lot of uh, publications in various index journals. And he has also been past president of Kerala Orthopedic Association. With this, I would like to welcome you both speakers. And may I request Professor Saw Aik to go ahead with his presentation, sir. Over to you, sir, Professor Saw Aik. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So let me just uh, set up my presentation. Okay. All right. So first, I would like to thank IOA for the Elizarov Subcommittee webinar, inviting me to share our knowledge on Blount disease. So I will start by talking on late presentation of Blount disease. Blount initially reported in German, this disease is initially reported in German literature, but it was not until Walter Brown published his series that it became popular in 1937. The pathology is localized, postural, uh, medial aspect of the physial plate is deficient, and then it causes these deformities, proximal tibia vara, trochabatum, increased posterior slope, internal tibia torsion with various degree of medial tibia plateau depression. Okay, so the condition, the cause is still not very known but is associated with early walking, obesity, and certain ethnic groups. Thompson classified according to infantile, juvenile, and adolescent, but real association with the age of onset is still questionable. Now, how to make a diagnosis? For many people based on radiology, in, in addition to the clinical appearance. Now, metaphysial diaphysia angle, more than 11, has been and uh, two, uh, how do you call that? A lot of false positive. So people increase until 16 degree. Still, it is not the absolute criteria. Yeah. Langen skioid, yeah, group them into this one, two, three, four, five, six. But uh, we do not use this very often because especially first one, two, and three, we usually don't do x-ray for all our cases. Yeah, if it is small degree and it resolves clinically, we just consider physiological boy. We don't take an x-ray. Then when it is progressive, then only we took an x-ray and try to classify and consider them as a blown disease. So the main thing is the progression clinically. Now, yes, uh, the way to radiologically, yes. Uh, uh, the check to Professor, there is a slight echo from the video which is playing. Can you mute the video that is playing? Uh, mute. Oh. Yeah, there is on the left side, there is a volume icon. On the video itself, which you are playing. Oh. Uh, video, let me see. On the left lower side, there is an icon of volume. Left lower side. Yes, that one. Just oh. mute it. Because we can, uh, then there is an echo. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, can you hear me? Now it is perfect. Ah, okay. So, yeah. uh, let me just wait. Huh? Just go back a bit. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, x ray, the method to Evaluate them. The simplest is femur tibia. Uh, I just go back a bit. Okay. All right. The easiest way to uh, classify them is femur tibia angle. But for the age, older age group, we usually like to use a femoral condal tibia sharp angle using the distal femur as a reference. Angle depressed medial plateau uh, angle is looking at the intra-articular changes. Sometimes we look at CT scan and MRI is usually for research purposes. Now a bit about management in general. Bracing, although it's quite popular, there is no strong evidence to support the effectiveness. Yeah? 
and it is not popular in our place because it is the weather is very humid for a child to wear long term in one day it is not very comfortable so these are some examples of the braces that people are using now this is the interesting paper from japan they don't have many cases so they have these multi-center studies look at this langenskoid stage one they classify them yeah so your slide them... is not moving here we are not seeing your slides oh we are not seeing slides your... are not uh wait so i think i will just share again yeah i will just share yeah, it maybe, again and i move maybe. further yeah so yeah there's no here, problem maybe i don't share sound and uh, okay. okay now just let me know yeah. whether you see the slide now yeah, yeah yeah okay i just go back a bit yeah yeah all right so you see for stage 1 half of the cases in infantile type it resolved without any any treatment at all not even brace so in our place we consider that physiological staging so you take x-ray you consider that as a blown and then it will resolve so imagine if it is in the center where all the cases you give autosis you assume that 90% of stage 1 the autosis work but in fact 50% it resolve by itself even for stage 2 you see there are those that resolve without any treatment so when we look at a study reporting the effectiveness of autosis we have to be careful because many of the cases would have improved spontaneously I'm not sure whether it is moving. It is moving. Okay. So uh, the other type is a proximal tibia osteotomy. And we only do this or consider it after two years old because we want to make sure it is not physiological bowing. Yeah. So before two, you're not sure. After two, if it is progressive, then it is blouse. There are many methods described in the literature like this one. Yeah? bamboo osteotomy by our uh, Indonesian surgeon and simple open or closing wedge osteotomy. This is our case of identical twins. This is the only one that we did before two years old. At one and a half, they are already progressive, especially one of the two twins there. So we do a opening wedge osteotomy, K-wire and POP cast. And then this is one year later. Yeah? So it's corrected and it do not recur anymore. Now, let us look at on older children, yeah, which is this topic for today. Now, we look at the reason we do this. Yeah? Limited experience by us on the older children, we feel that there is a small group, especially early adolescent, 8 to 12 years old. Even after correction, they recurred very fast. I'll show you one example. And then we also notice older children, especially those near adolescent or even the grown-up, they do not have very severe medial plateau depression. Whether they are, like people say, a separate group altogether, or they are actually the normal blouse. It's just that the plateau is not as bad as we thought when we see them earlier. Now, the reason we want to treat is because TKR for obese patient, the result is not so good. We know that. In addition to that, this study might not only TKR for blouse disease as we expected, there is many cases postural medial bone defect and also there are ligament laxity that they need constraint implant all this bone defect instability and obese patient all are associated with poor result on tkr so of course the only solution for this is to avoid tkr altogether so now how do we do that for older children growth guidance is it helpful for older children? It is minimal invasive. So most of us will sort of give it a try unless the child is symptomatic. But it is not very predictable because the physio plate not healthy and implant failure is one problem. You go to Google search many series that shows like this. Now, this is our patient at 12 years old. 12 years old, quite severe. So do we, there is not, he is not symptomatic. So we decided to give it a try, growth guidance. Yeah. So we do something like this and 
we see last few years, see whether it's helpful. The right side looks like it's improving. The left side, unfortunately, improved a bit. But yeah, then at 15 years old, and then uh, 17, yeah, and then finally 18 years old. So the right side shows some improvement, but the left side, probably nothing happened. But then is it helpful? The right side, probably so. Because now, if it is less than 20 degree, you may do simple high tibia osteotomy. The left side probably is remained the same. You could have treated it earlier. So the outcome is less predictable. Now, this hemi epiphysiodesis, so studies have shown those 10, 20 degrees, uh, you can expect changes, but those 30 and above, many of the cases, they do not improve. We also know that with age growth remaining, of course, yeah, if a child is younger, you can expect better correction compared to the those who come late. Now, eight plate failure, these studies shows that 44% of the cases, near to half, they have screw breakage. And this multi-center study among POSMA members, 15% of them say that at least one, some may have more cases, you have screw broken. So if you want to do this, remember maybe we can use a non-cannulated screw which is stronger two plates or special plate as you see there yeah you have two screws on one segment then it's less likely to happen now acute correction and osteotomy without plateau now this is useful to address deformities except for medial plateau yeah we are talking about sharp angular correction and it is useful for less severe deformity yeah now the problem concern of severe deformity is compartment syndrome, neurovascular injury, or even the implant failure. This patient is very heavy. And there are many yeah, different osteotomy types reported in literature on this. Very often, we see the alignment is less than ideal. Why? Now, look at this analysis. We are using Elizarov method. Yeah? The Cora usually is quite high. But when we do osteotomy below the tibia tubercle, like this, uh, you see the K-wire. So it's a closing wedge on the lateral side. So the hinge is basically on the medial plateau. It's uh, not at the level of Cora. So if you do that, you would expect some degree of displacement. Yeah, it's a translation. Although you may argue that uh, that doesn't matter very much, but it doesn't look very nice. And many other reports are like this. However, if you do high tibia osteotomy, when you place the hinge higher up like this, yeah, then the cora is about the same level. So you see it is more anatomical, not so much of translation. But all this, you are not for too severe deformity. You have two bones there, you rotate, you correct, higher risk of complications. Now, what about this medial tibia plateau elevation? Now, it supposed to improve the intra-articular congruency. It may also help to stretch up, yeah, the, reduce the ligament laxity. But then you need some surgery, additional osteotomy to correct mechanical axis, especially for severe deformity. Yeah? And there are two level osteotomy, you may expect problem with the healing itself. So this is uh, for uh, adolescent children. They do an open wedge and then they use Elizarov to correct the metaphyseal injury. So one is internal fixation and one is used external fixator. Some surgeons will do two internal fixation, yeah? elevate the plateau and then correct the metaphyses and just fix it. Yeah, this is their series, McCarty, double level osteotomy. Some even more aggressive do triple osteotomy. Yeah, osteotomy means that like this is a first case, not acceptable. They do a second time, but triple osteotomy. Elevation of medial plateau, metaphyseal, correct the varus, and then one more for tibia tubercle, try to medialize or lateralize it. But with every additional osteotomy, you have risk of uh, healing, risk of implant failure and mechanical problem. So the risk is always there. Yeah. Now, what about gradual correction? Gradual correction, the one we do is extra articular. Although there are some surgeons incorporate medial plateau elevation in the X fix, it is useful when there's severe deformity and even when there is a rotational problem. Yeah? So it is less invasive to the soft tissue. And what about heavy patient? So in our hands, 
it is not a problem. X fix, if you fix it enough, it can yeah, carry the weight of the patient. The problem is family. Yeah, it is not easy to take care of external fixator, pin side, wound care, rehabilitation, and so on. It may be difficult for some family members. So this is one of our early cases, yeah, nine year old. So there is not much of rotation. So we use Elizarov to correct it. Uh, so Elizarov gradual correction. This is a few years post-op. Now it's more than 20 years. He don't come for follow-up, but he's a relative of one of our orthopedic surgeons. So we know he's a businessman now, 20 over years old, and uh, he still not have problem with the knee. This is a 12 year old, older child. So you see the Cora for blouse is usually higher up. We use blount, uh, this uh, Elizarov method to correct then we managed to get the alignment, uh, realigned it, and it maintained. Now, this 13-year-old, again, uh, the Cora is a bit high, but the thing is, he's heavy. So we need some bone purchase for proximal segment. So the osteotomy is a bit lower. We put it a bit lower down. So we know that we'll have some degree of translation. This osteotomy rule number two, there'll be medial pro prominence. Yeah? But we thought this is okay. So one side is being done, and then left side is a second leg. And then after that, now this is what we get. So you can see there's some prominence on the medial side because of the translation. But mechanical axis is okay. This is acceptable. But then, although the patient lost a lot of weight compared to before, but then even the prominence is not so obvious. Yeah, you see the medial, the shin area, that prominent is okay. Not a problem. But there's no more knee pain the axis has already restored. Now, this child come older, 16-year-old. So we did this uh, using a TSF because there is a significant rotation. The left side is already done, although we have to say a bit overcorrected. 28 years old, yeah, he's still under, she's still under follow-up and uh, there's no symptoms of the knee. Now, the thing is for the proximal segment, how do we purchase them stably? We do is we get at the level of the tibia tubercle, we put one wire. This wire is parallel to the distal femoral condyle. Huh? We use that as the axis. So after that, we put a ring and below the ring, we use single hole rancho cube. Two of them at the same level, both of them single hole. They don't cross midline. They are crossing, they are touching at the back, you can see. So this, after that, we do osteotomy. And after the osteotomy, you put the third one as close to the corticotomy as possible because the bone is very strong. Let us look at the x-ray, how we do this. Even when there is a physial plate, it's still there. Uh, okay, so even the physial plate is still there. You see the distal femoral condyle and we put the wire. Yeah, You may remove the wire, it's not so important. But after the wire, then you put the ring and then you put uh, two rancho cube. Yeah, both of them at the same level pointing to the backs, not crossing the midline. Then you do a corticotomy and you put the third one. Yeah, so these three half pin, five millimeter or six if old, able to strong support the patient's weight. This is 24 year old. She was 150, go through gastric stapling and so on, reduced to 05. And surgeons say, cannot go down, then that will be dangerous. So we use Elizarov to correct both sides. So eventually, this is the restoration that we can get. Yeah. So mechanical axis restored, the pain has resolved. Now, this is the oldest patient, 24 year old, when presented to us. Now, the deformity was there since early childhood. The seven-year-old x-ray, she had the first operation, and this is after operation. So the operation does not be successful. So he has this at the age of 24, came to see us. So since there is significant internal tibia caution, we use Taylor spatial frame, both sides. You see there is a translation, but mechanical axis is restored. So before the frame removal, after removal 2008, he had a fall during a basketball game, fractured the right tibia through the half pin, eh? but we fix it with a locking plate, it healed nice. So now 2016, and it's still on our follow-up, although we don't have the latest x-ray. Yeah? The knee yeah, is still comfortable, it's not painful. Now, this is a special case of recurrence I want to share with you, nine-year-old. 
Now, she came to us with very severe deformity. Physio plate is still there. So we consider this as a blount. So we use a tailored spatial frame. So we correct them. And I want you to pay attention to the correction. You look at the proximal fragment. You see the half pin close to the osteotomy. But look at the angle compared to the shaft. Yeah, we restore it at that time. But the correction is about 35, 45 degree of correction. All right. So after one, two months after this, we remove, allowed to go back. And she never returned. Until three years later, the mother sent a photograph of her like this. We thought this is an early pre-op photograph. But actually, this is the current photograph after operation for three years. It recurred. So we can't, how can that happen? We corrected it. Yeah. Then this is the x-ray that she has. You look at the alignment of the proximal segment and the shaft now. It has recurred. This is not growth guidance. It's not, it's not the growth plate. It's not the rebound. It is totally yeah, corrected. We call it remodeling, but remodeling is supposed to go into normal. This is go to abnormal. Yeah? The 35, 45 degree correction has gone. But at age 14, we thought this probably have something to do with the growth. So we correct it again, but this time we just do slide over correction. So we are not doing that. So this is the before op. We thought we'll give it a try and it should not happen. So this is at 16. So it do not happen anymore. We feel that only happened about 8 to 12 years old during the early adolescent. So we have to be very careful with that. Now, looking at all these comparing acute and gradual correction, uh, overall, level three evidence, we have only a few. Yeah? We don't have very strong evidence so far because the cases are very sm a small number, is most serious. So level three evidence, gradual correction with TSF is more accurate, provide more accurate correction than acute correction or those using monolateral fixation coming from the front. This one we can anticipate now yeah, we can expect that because we can adjust the tailor spatial frame or any hex support level four evidence acute correction is associated with higher risk of peroneal injury and although most of them are transient this is also what we can understand but there are many other issues questions although we're doing it but we don't have really strong evidence to show which one is better so in summary we are talking about older children Growth guidance, it is, still, it is still possible to use, especially when the medial physis looks healthy, especially in the younger children. Even if it do not get complete correction, I think it's still useful. Acute correction is uh, helpful for less severe deformity. And medial plateau elevation, uh, most surgeons will consider, consider this when it's more than 30 degree of depression. Nearly most of the cases, we use Elizabeth correction. Older children, we do not touch the medial plateau. We do extra articular correction. As you can see, remember, many of the cases, older or even at adolescent, the depression is less than 30 degrees. And then the last one, gradual correction. This is for severe multiplanar deformities, but be careful, pathological fracture, when they go into games and so on through the half pin site, and recurrent deformity in age 8 to 12 years old. So it is better to do sort of an overcorrection. But how much overcorrection? I don't think we have enough cases to share what to do. It's just that be aware and tell the parents that it may happen. So the final outcome, what we want to achieve is a stable knee joint. When the alignment is correct, the patient walk, they feel better. There's not much of ligament laxity and so on. Pain could be relieved and then reduce the risk of premature osteoarthritis. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sai. And this was really a wonderful presentation. Uh, you shared the methods from the growth guidance up to the very heavy and very difficult late presentation is dealt with this or uh, six axis correction. 
of course it will be a very very uh, very useful tool that's a destruction of stereogenesis for severe deformities you showed a very degree from a minor ones to the major ones perhaps i think that uh, the growth modulation would need accurate uh, timings in addition to the other aspects of managing uh, guided growth i think timing also timing of timing of uh, growth modification is also important secondly uh, would it be uh, is uh, do you have an experience with say, using simply an elizero one elizero frame rather than the 6 axis okay uh actually when we started that uh, i think uh, we have hex support only after 2007 before that it is all elizero that's the only one we have and apparently the deformity the rotational deformity is not too bad but once we have hex support we go and look for it nearly most cases have rotational internal tibial torsion so most of the cases for blau disease now we are using hex support external fixator so, what so, was my concern actually sir mm-hmm. because concern is that once if you are using only an elizero fixation maybe the your osteotomy level would go closer because in case of an hexapod you are trying to use the rancho cubes down below so your osteotomy tends to go still more further away from the cora maybe oh. that is the reason for giving more of angulation during correction more of translation oh uh i think for us the indication for elizero and taylor spatial frame it is no different except for we want the rotation we know that the taylor frame or hex support anteriorly you have this oblique struts huh? but the way we design the two yeah first rancho cube below that we can apply it for in fact it's easier to apply on elizero is more difficult to apply on hex support fixator the the plan that we put it was try to get a narrow segment we can do the osteotomy as high as possible we choose the tibia tubercle because anything above the tibia tubercle last time we use it but you know the joint line sometimes comes a bit close so we try to do everything below the tibia tubercle two half pin just one rancho cube below and the sec the third one is actually next to corticotomy so you just need 4 or 5 cm of bone below tibia tubercle so that is the technique we try to show a short segment you can provide a fixation that can load 100 kg patient uh, so yeah. it has nothing to do with the selection of the either hex support or elizero fixator so fixation is still the same it's just that the hex support can do a bit of rotation that's all and whether the correction of rotation other than looks better whether functionally any difference i don't think i know the answer yeah thank you thank you sir this was really a wonderful presentation we have two experts from our national faculty as dr vasudevan he is from palakkad and then we have the president of uh, assami india dr ruta dr ruta has a question and me yeah. then i okay. request dr vasu also if he has any questions right so first of all thank you very much professor for the enlightening presentation i just wanted to know in case of very severe uh, deformity in older patients how do you handle uh, ligamentous laxity because that sometimes is a big problem this is severe lateral collateral laxity so how do you manage that okay so the collateral actually as i said all our cases now we correct extra articular so we do not uh, address the ligamentous laxity the strategy we are using is that yes severe lateral collateral the medial side is probably not so lax but there is a medial depression we correct the external fixator until it's slightly over correction now this is a bit tricky because if you use the standing axis uh, when blau disease when they stand the angle is not accurate because you look at the joint line the lateral side is open up is actually flex but when you correct let's say the joint open up 10 degree let's say using that excessive 10 degree but when you correct until mechanical axis just go lateral to the middle of the knee that 10 degree will close down then suddenly it become if from zero it becomes 10 degree valgus yeah 
So the strategy, what we do is we use the external fixator. And then when we think that we reach the correction yeah, on the lower limb axis or maybe standing, we looks like it's okay. I tell our doctors, do not send and check x-ray. Yeah, it will confuse everyone. You give them two or three weeks to stand properly, put some weight. Don't do x-ray. Then after two or three weeks, you don't do any correction and you ask them to stand, stand properly. Then only you go and take an x-ray at that time. So that time, they can bear a bit more weight. And then we look at the mechanical axis. As long as mechanical axis is slightly maybe zero to five degree lateral to the joint line, to the middle of the knee. Okay, we accept that and we stop the correction. Very often, once you reach there, you immediately send the patient to take a radiologic x-ray to check whether you have reached. They may be in pain, they flex the knee, they don't stand properly. That radiograph may not be accurate. So you may end up with an incorrect, not so accurate correction. You correct too much, you'll go into valgus, especially when the lateral joint line close down. And then if it's under, you know what may happen. So the only thing I can share with you what we do is we don't take x-ray immediately one or two weeks or even one month. Yeah, Because when they are at 14, 15 in the old, they are not going to unite so fast. So until they can stand properly, take a radiograph, stand properly and just get it just slightly lateral to the middle of the knee. Mm. Okay, so you, you take the mechanical axis more lateral to compensate Slight for the Slight lateral. Slightly Slight lateral, lateral on the okay. proper weight bearing. On the proper weight bearing, slight lateral. So the joint line is close up. That means the, med the lateral collateral ligament is not stretched anymore. Once okay. it's a bit, just a bit medial, then the joint line will open up and you get five degree extra. It goes to varus and then you will recur or whatever may happen. So that is the thing that we use that as a guideline. Okay. And do you do any time an oblique uh, osteotomy or you, you always do a transverse? Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, so far, the osteotomy we do at the level, we do transverse. Uh, transverse to the longitudinal axis. Yeah. The reason being, if you do horizontal, for example, you do when the patient's standing pure horizontal, the proximal segment, the medial side is very sharp. It will be piercing the skin. And if you do more vertical, the vertical part you are cutting up and then it take away proximal cortex for you to fix. You need the pericorticotomy cortex. That is the strongest cortex. So, so far, what we do is just 90 degree to the shaft and then we put the third half pin uh, just perpendicular, very close to the corticotomy to purchase that. That, that is what we do. But I think it is possible to do it separately to increase the area of the bone exactly. contact. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good evening, Soi. Hello. Masu, do you have any questions? I'm Hello. I think we yes. met first in Bindulu, Sarawak. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. A long time. Okay, long time ago. Yeah, after that, we met in many meetings. Anyway, I congratulate you on a, an excellent uh, presentation on uh, Brown's disease. Mm -hmm. How do you, how often you have to do lengthen of the, lengthening of the segment? Uh, lengthening, uh, we do lengthening only when it is unilateral. If it is unilateral, now I have to say that you see most of the cases, those come late, huh? come at adolescent, come at uh, old age and adulthood, they are bilateral. I suppose if they are unilateral, they probably will go to see doctor earlier. Let bilateral, somehow they are, as long as not painful, they tolerated it. Yeah, The one at 24 years old, he studied in Australia. He graduated before coming back and look for treatment because the surgeon in Australia asked him, you cannot go around like this. So he come back and treated us. So the older children somehow, the, the fact that they delayed for so long is probably bilateral. They thought that nothing can be done. They sort of accept this. 
Yeah. So older patients that we have, nearly most of them are bilateral, but the unilateral probably they will accept treatment earlier before 10 years old. Yeah, in, in some of the cases which come late, say about 20, 20 years or 24 years, mm -hmm. have you seen a distal femur compensation like distal femur valgus? Valgus, yeah. Correct. How do, you, how do you approach that? Okay. The distal femur, there are some or these older patients. In fact, I do have a few slides on that. I take it away because it may be too long. So they may have a compensatory. Yeah? But for these patients, they have been walking with a joint line at that degree until they are 20, 24, 25 years old. So now only they develop some degree of pain. So to address the severe deformity at the tibia itself would already take a lot of resources and correction. And then to do the osteotomy, I'm concerned about other things like healing and so on. Quite often, we are talking about maybe five degree or less, the, the extra compensatory yeah, to go into valgus. So, so far for a few cases that I showed you, we do not treat the distal femur valgus. So you see the joint line is not perfectly horizontal. The thing is the joint itself is already pathological. You know, the tibia, the plateau is not like parallel. One side is maybe 10, 20 degrees. There are some crepitus already by the time they see us. So, so far for those cases, I just focus on the tibia and I get the mechanical axis through the middle. So that means that I incorporate the distal femur. I intentionally not to correct. So I just make the whole limb, the mechanical axis go to the middle and then do not correct the distal femur from the beginning. So I do not have the evidence or authority to say that is something that we should do or not. But having said that, our patients, many of them, the fact that they come only at that stage yeah, before any treatment related to the fact they are not from KL, they are not very sort of cooperative or compliance may be the issue. So to do both sides and to get everything correct, we thought that is the target that we can achieve and I don't aim further to correct. Yeah. So once we correct that, we basically burn the bridge. We cannot correct the femur anymore because once you correct it, it goes to varus again. So I can only tell, for example, the, the man with uh, 24 years old. Now he is, he is an engineer. He worked in East Malaysia. 2007, his operation until now. On and off, he still called me. He is still yeah, able to do his work without severe pain. He has over, uh, how they call that? The femur is a bit valgus, but we just correct until the middle. So I, I can only share with you that I'm not yeah. saying this is the correct thing to do. So when, when if you're accepting distal femur valgus and trying to get the mechanical access to the center of the knee, then naturally you have to accept an equal amount of proximal tibial virus. Mm -mm. Then only it the, uh, Yes, the thing is proximal tibia, when you say proximal tibia virus, if this is a normal proximal tibia, it's easy to say. You know where is the level. This patient, they do have some degree of depression. It's just that I do not elevate them. The lateral and the medial, they are probably 10 or maybe 20 degree different. So what is normal? So it's basically, yeah. And if they before skeletal maturity, we know that we can't see the actual cartilage. And we know that there's a gap filled in by thickened, uh, how do you call that, the meniscus and structures like that. Now, that part is also something that we do not have enough literature. There are many people use MRI to check, yeah, to say that the meniscus, everything thickened, compensate for the gap that we are seeing. So there are a few more questions that we do not know the answer. So the actual what is the actual alignment that we should get? That I think, that's why I said, this is just what we have done. And so far our patients, they tolerated so long without needing TKR and so on. 
So that is what I have done nah, to share with everyone. Mm -mm. It may not be the optimal, uh, what call optimal treatment of choice. Thank you. Shamsul, do we have any questions from the YouTube or audience? Yes, we have uh, one question. Uh, we have a question from uh, Doha, Qatar, by Dr. Mabashir, pediatric orthopedic surgeon. He has uh, three questions. I'll be asking one by one. His first question is, uh, is it wise to do CT scan routinely in Blount's disease to rule out presence of physical bar? And is there any evidence of addressing this issue surgically present? Is the first question. Okay. Now, we do not do CT scan routinely. Yeah. Uh, for two reasons. Because there are, yes, there are a few cases we see at 8, 9, 10, but many of them are 14, 15 and adult 20 plus. So even if you see, we are not going to make any much of correction. There's another reason is that, as I said, personally, I really not very sure whether this, the, how they call Langerskjöld's classification shows the sequence of the event. Yeah. So many cases that we see when they reach the skeletal maturity, the plateau, the angulation is actually less. So I checked with this uh, Perry Shoemaker from uh, what I call USA about his experience. He also noticed that many patients who come very old, uh, the angle of depression is actually less, so as if it is improving by itself. One possibility is that many of the defect is cartilage, but when they do scattered maturity, they become ossified. We cannot see very well. So rather than seeing the growth plate, It'll be interesting if you see actually how much cartilage is there, whether we need to elevate or not. The gap there probably is not the defect. So we don't do CT scan, but that brings to another question. Do we do MRI for them to see the meniscus? We were trying to conduct a study for a group of patients, but the thing is when we start a study and get some grant and all when we start want to look for patient, the patient never come. No patient. For that, I think one year or one and a half year, we cannot see any patient. So finally, we did not do this. And then the patient comes back for whatever reason. So it will be interesting if somebody interested uh, to check into the actual what happened using an MRI. What is this defect that we see on x-ray? Whether it is a, just a cartilage that is not ossified, is a meniscus, or it is what other structure? And what happened if we come to skeletal maturity? So we don't do CT scan routinely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sir. Question two. Question. Yes. So, so the second question is: uh, uh, in order to address the issue of sloping articular surface, is it wise to go for double osteotomy, including an intraepiphyseal correction? Uh, again, to the depression, right? Yes, yeah. sir. Okay, okay. MFICL uh, elevation. That's right. So now, our patient, except for I think only two cases, yeah, all the rest, we do not do elevation. We do extra articular correction. We try to get the alignment as right as possible. When they stand, when they weight bearing, the mechanical axis from the head of femur into the ankle goes slightly from the slightly lateral to the middle of the knee joint so that medial collateral ligament are not stretched. That is our target. And so far from the patients we see, the longest I think is 15 years, they are the one that I show you, the Elizarov case, that is already more than 20 years, but we don't have a follow-up. Like we just know he's still walking around. So we have not get patient coming back for the knee problem because of that. So I do have a question that whether the defect needs to be elevated or not. Uh, I think we recently published a, K, uh, a journal of orthopedic surgery of our series. We have Elizarov cases and we have x-ray on them when we do it. And Elizarov itself take about one year or so. And then after that, follow up. And we, we don't treat the, we don't do plateau elevation. So we look at the x-ray on follow up retrospectively. And we notice that the angle of depression 
is less one or two years later. Those who reach skeletal maturity, we treat them like 24-year-old guy and also some 21-year-old. No change yeah? from the time we do operation and a few years on the last follow-up, no change. But all the rest, on the teenage, adolescent, 13, 14, 15, those cases, we see the angle depression by the time pre-op. And then now, post-op, we look at them, it is less. But how much less, how much the body can reduce this depression, I really do not know. I just can tell you, most of our cases, we do not elevate the plateau. We just try to restore mechanical axis so that the force will step on close the lateral plateau so it do not disturb the medial side. Offload the medial side, put it this way. So the medial side will be offload. The medial collateral will stretch it. And I don't know, maybe that is the reason it starts to grow. It starts to ossify. So that, again, is what uh, we, we learn uh, from our patients. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mubashir, I would like sir, to... Just a, uh, another question, sir. May I, sir? Please. So sir. The last question. Yeah. Last question is the uh, guided growth modulation using eight plates. Are there any long-term outcomes about the fate of the proximal tibia articular surface, considering the fact that medial side is already sloping? Okay. Uh, I think this uh, growth modulation on the late onset, we don't do many cases because most of them, yeah, because most of them, they come too late. And the other thing is that uh, if you see, look at the literature, one classic thing about this late onset, uh, the one they come to see us late, they usually come with a severe deformity. And the fact that they don't come before is they are tolerating the deformity, they come because it's painful. So once a patient is painful, you don't talk about growth modulation anymore. Yeah. For me, I believe what is painful, that means the damage is quite significant. And you don't put a growth modulation, ask them tolerate for another one, two years and gradually improve. No, there are a few cases that we did. Those are without pain. I think when I show you the case we have, we told you that this is asymptomatic. That's why we play around with it. But when they are painful and they come, you have to correct it because otherwise the medial side will damage beyond repair. So the chances of doing growth guidance is only those who have probably mild degree, but the main thing is asymptomatic. They don't have pain yet. We don't have many cases to share about their long-term outcome like in our own series. So the, Thank you, sir. Yes, ask the, uh, the view of the panel also for these questions. Yes, please. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Vashin, maybe it's a, for hemipalatal elevation, I think you have to make a judgment between having a more complicated hemipalatal elevation rather than accepting a best one best joint line. And Dr. Uh, Professor Saik will perhaps uh, agree with that, that you could have a one best joint line. These are the two plateaus. So you could have one best joint line that takes care of the, the joint lab rather than having a complicated hemiplatal elevation. That is more complication. The one has to judge between these two. Maybe a smaller deformity, smaller plate, uh, this depression would be best dealt with the best joint line so that the, there is a common joint line that becomes more uh, this anatomical. So, Dr. Chairi wanted to say a word. Yeah, Altaf, I would prefer, I always consider, I mean, if there is an, I always look for the intraarticular depression. And if there is an intraarticular depression, I always make sure that I correct it because. It's two deformities, two coras. Yeah. So the, I don't think there's any, uh, I mean, it's, I don't think it's right to correct with just a matter of, and I'll show you a case also where such has been done, mm. to correct an intraarticular deformity and a metafacial deformity with just a, met, a metafacial osteotomy alone. Yeah, yeah, because that's why I said the smaller deformities could be dealt with the best joint line. But if you have a severe deformity, then as you rightly said that, you could address it together. Thank you. I think we have had enough questions. One, one minute, Alta. Yeah, yeah, please. When there's a medial slope and severe slope, I think that it's not justified to do a lateral epiphysiodesis. So that will produce again a lateral slope and ultimately end with the pagoda tibia. 
right 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 so that's that that's that that, that makes us to make uh, even the distraction osteogenesis and correction rather than depending on guided growth so it's more important to have this tool in uh, one's armamentarium and this is really the wonderful tool to deal with late presentations thank you so much professor sai it was a wonderful yes. discussion and wonderful presentation we have cleared many doubts and many doubts of the audience must have been cleared may we go to the next presentation we have from uh, dr cherry kovur please dr cherry go ahead with your presentation yeah the same my screen yeah please please go ahead okay can you see the screen yeah yes sir yeah i'm going to talk about i think first of all let me thank my good friend alta for inviting me and also ruta as the president of asami so i'll be talking on untreated and mismanaged blount's disease treatment with elisero one minute yeah now just recapitulating it's uh, blount's disease is a disorder of the proximal tibial growth plate medially which causes a progressive varus knee align malalignment in children and adolescents now the reasons are early onset of walking the it is seen more in early onset walking and obese patients and african american patients have more uh, higher incidence of blount's disease and as we have seen bilaterals are more common than unilaterals now why the question why it is untreated many a time i mean this is a classic teaching when somebody had told that i cannot see what the mind does not know it simply means that many of the surgeons are just not aware of such an entity called blount's disease probably because it's not a very common condition and there is a lack of knowledge of clinical and radiological features and third is many a time it may not be present in the classical form it may not have all the radiological findings and early stage of the disease may resemble de developmental severe genu varum and it's quite difficult to distinguish a severe developmental genu varum with the blount's disease and there is a lack of long term follow up of the varus deformities and and in my state especially untreated or maltreated there is a strong influence of ayurveda because here they believe that anything and everything can be cured by ayurvedic treatment so they waste a lot of time a lot of money and uh, do this ayurveda treatment and come back with very complicated cases uh, come with a lot of problems now clinical features are similar to physiological genu varum many of these children are obese but not always and there is often a lateral thrust on walking and there are i'll just for the highlight the radiological features one is an abrupt varus angulation metaphyseal at the uh, metaphyseal at the metaphyseal uh, uh, diaphyseal junction there's widened irregular epiphysis medially medial slope of the uh, the grow the articular surface then there is a prominent beaking of the metaphysis and lateral subluxation of the tibia we may not see all these features in uh, in all the cases but the presence of especially medially sloped epiphysis and irregular facial line medially should alert the surgeon to the presence of blount's disease now differential diagnosis of physiological genu varum which sometimes is quite difficult to distinguish from that genu varum rickets It, that's a classical feature about it skeletal dysplasias have multiple problems so it's not too difficult to distinguish that and post infectious genu varum can be dis, uh, opt, uh, distinguished from the history and other features now why is it mismanaged because there's a lack of knowledge of the stages and the relevant pathoanatomy and failure to identify the deformities and the locations probably wrong surgery wrong implant and inadequate correction probably these are the causes of mismanaging blount's disease now these are the stages which langens coil described and uh, stage 1 to 2 complete restoration stage 3 to 4 restoration is possible stage 5 and 6 it leads to a lot of problems but there is a catch in it it's not very he described it for the scandinavian population so it's not very accurate for non whites and stages can uh, occur earlier in non whites and can skip one i mean couple of stages and go to stage 6 also 
and it's worse in black girls and unfortunately no data there exists on the indian population regarding brown's disease so we are not sure how the disease behaves in the indian population so basically what with my limited experience is i have found out the treatment what treatment you do depends on the stage and age of the patient now what we have seen is 2 to 3 years is the best time for conservative treatment now any case that is not treated after 3 years i think can be labeled as untreated now any case wrongly treated either conservatively or surgically can be labeled as mismanaged now the problem is when it's a failed conservative treatment i don't know how do you classify it whether it's untreated or mismanaged now even conservative treatment if you're not careful if you're not careful with the orthosis can be mismanaged now having a look at this patient the metallic uprights are exactly where it should not be in the lateral side and this with the patient has been wearing for the last 2 uh, years and i'm sure she's going to need an osteotomy they'll come back one of these days for the corrective osteotomy so again treatment depends on the stage of the disease and age of the patient you need to define the location and magnitude one minute let me just magnitude of the deformity or the deformities which exists additional investigations as needed and you need to select the appropriate technique depending on the stage of the disease and the age of the patient now stage 1 and 2 as i said before before 3 years many a time conservative treatment works good bracing will work sometimes you may not need any treatment but if it is progressive i would prefer to treat it if it is below the age of 3 years before with conservative treatment now more than 3 years and progressive a metaphyseal corrective osteotomy and fixation either with acute or gradual correction or external or internal fixation but i would prefer to overcorrect it to 5 to 6 degree of valgus now this is a case with uh, stage 2 and one of the sites is a stage 3 one of those borderline cases corrected with bilateral illusor o-ring fixation that's the end result it's slightly overcorrected now this is before and this is after the lateral thrust is gone the varus deformity is gone now stage 3 again we need only corrective osteotomy in the metaphysis but delaying surgery in the stage 3 can cause there is a increased chances of recurrence this is a boy with the stage 3 bilateral we did i always prefer to do an arthrogram intraop rather than an mri because arthrogram gives me equal information and uh, about the intraarticular depression so and it's a easy technique to do the arthrogram and you're not dependent on a radiologist to interpret the findings so the arthrogram didn't show any intraarticular depression so we proceeded with a metaphyseal osteotomy alone and that's after the full correction patient once the osteotomy is united he can walk full weight bearing he does they will walk full weight bearing that's the end result it's slightly over correction on the right side but uh, left side is well corrected clinically it's low okay. now the question is do we need to over correct yes about 5 to 7 degrees of valgus is needed by, according to most of the authors because it offsets the tendency for varus recurrence now stage 4 and 5 are more serious facial arrest has already occurred although not seen radiologically now here we need to recognize that there are two deformities a metaphyseal deformity and an epiphyseal or intraarticular deformity and the treatment must be individualized so this is the one of those cases with the intraarticular depression which is can be very very well seen on the x ray itself now younger than 3 years and um, 7 years middle epiphyseal is epiphyseal lysis and interposition material and metaphyseal osteotomy does address the uh, growth rest on the medial side and restores the articular surface but more than 7 years if epiphyseal lysis is less effective and you need an intraarticular osteotomy and elevation in addition to the metaphyseal osteotomy this is a 9 year old girl stage 4 so the arthrogram shows the intraarticular depression 
So we did the intraarticular osteotomy elevation with a fibula strut graft. And now the metaphyseal virus deformity is obvious. We waited for about six weeks, I mean 12 weeks. Once the child was again full weight bearing, she had dream gained a knee range of motion. We put the illicero frame to correct the metaphyseal deformity. And that's a child walking after the union of the osteotomies. That's the end result. No, stage six is bad. Already medial bony bridge and epifacial closure has occurred. And as long as the growth occurs, deformity will progress. Here there are definitely, without question, two deformities, intraarticular and extraarticular. Now it needs, without question, two osteotomies, intraarticular and metaphyseal osteotomy. Now this is 11 year old girl, previously operated at the age of seven years with only metaphyseal osteotomy. Now this is a clinical picture with pretty severe virus. That's intraarticular depression, stress x-rays. Now that's a gait. Is there any rotational deformity? We don't know. With the inter Looks like a lot, quite a bit of internal rotation deformity also in the right, more on the right side. Now, CT scan, whether it's helpful or not, I'm not really sure because all the same, because considering the deformity, we took a CT scan, but I don't know whether it gives any additional information other than the x-rays. And especially when somebody asked about the growth plate status, I think MRI gives a better information rather than the CT scan about the growth plate status. Now, here we have to do the intraarticular correction, that is intraarticular elevation of the medial plateau fixation with fibula strut grafts and screws. And once the deformity, the intraarticular deformity was corrected, we noticed that the right side had a varus deformity of 20 degrees and the left had an oblique plane deformity. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of hang up. Yeah. That's the clinical picture. The left side, you can see the oblique plane hinges. That's the X, immediate post-op X-rays. Now, we had to do a rotational correction also. And you can see the almost the 100% translation that has occurred on the right side. But we got it corrected. That's how the girl is walking with the frame on. That's a union. Even with 100% translation, it is united completely. That's after frame removal, about four months after frame removal, the mechanical axis is aligned. That's an initial X-ray, I mean, initial gait pattern. That's a pre end result gait pattern. Now the correction has been maintained without much of a problem. And this is after six years, the correction is still maintained. The X-ray correction, the radiological correction is also still maintained. That's a gate after six years of uh, after frame removal. Now the adolescent blounts, it's an older age group, more than eight years. Some of the children are obese, not all. It's only always the metaphyseal virus. There is almost always no articular involvement and they come quite late as Professor Ike has uh, said. This is a fellow, an 18 year old fellow who is presented late, he had medial knee pain and middle joint line tenderness. And you can see the lateral thrust on walking. So we just did a corrective metaphyseal osteotomy and uh, a realignment. And a slightly overcorrection to valgus, but he has no pain now, even after about six years. So the complications that can occur with the Blount's disease are recurvatum deformity, recurrence of the deformity, anti-retibial artery with compartment syndrome, that's with acute corrections, common peroneal nerve palsy, either iatrogenic or due to the lengthening, and of course, sometimes infection. The, the recurvatum is almost always iatrogenic, injury to the proximal tibial growth plate, too high an osteotomy, 
whereas recurrence can occur this was the boy which we in fact we had overcorrected to valgus if you remember the previous case who had that stage 3 problem in fact there was a pretty severe overcorrection to varus and still the deformity recurred after about 8 years this is acute corrections can cause anti problems this was one of the acute corrections and the anti tibial artery got injured now one thing i want to highlight is the proper x rays because you need the proper x rays for accurate measurement of the deformity for a location and the magnitude of the deformity always take this is for the uh, junior orthopedic surgeons always take the x ray with the patella pointing forwards and the pelvis leveled because otherwise you'll get wrong information now this is a boy who didn't have not, not so severe deformity but when he was walking the deformity was quite severe now if you look at the x ray it looks pretty innocent but then the the feet are pointing forwards there is the pelvis the height is not compensated the pelvis is not leveled so we took a proper x ray with the pelvis patella pointing forwards and the pelvis leveled and the deformity becomes obvious mri not really useful as per, except for the medial growth plate status and i feel the medial articular depression can be well seen on the arthrogram again the mri needs assistance of a radiologist and again needs sedation and anesthesia in young children so in summary especially after stage 3 consider the possibility of an intraarticular deformity and an arthrogram is invaluable in defining the intraarticular deformity and after correction of the intraarticular deformity we only then we can assess and the location and magnitude of the metaphyseal deformity and gradual correction is what i prefer because it reduces the chances of under or over correction and always have good x rays because your correction depends on that and many a time the, to the younger colleagues please don't be stumped by the deformity keep the patella straight and the deformity becomes clear always clinically examine the patient view from front behind and side proper x rays full length including full length x rays and stress x rays malalignment test to locate the cora or coras ct and mri rarely needed but if you need it go ahead spend time with the patient discuss the pros and cons of various treatment and warn that recurrence may occur in later especially if the patient presents late thank you very much thank you dr cherry it was really an excellent presentation and i think you removed many of the confusions we had before like the audience was asking for i think you clear uh, regarding the hemiplegic plateau elevation and the recurrences also uh, may I have uh, questions from our experts dr ruta yeah uh, thank you cherry for an excellent presentation I just uh, was wondering, why do you always uh, do the correction at two stages? Why not combine the plateau elevation and metaphyseal correction in, at one surgery? I mean, why why always in two stages? It's uh, I mean, it's a personal preference, Ruta. It's a question of, uh, I feel it's easier to manage it with the, I mean, the, do the intraarticular part first and do the epiphyseal correction, I mean, the metaphyseal correction next. Because I had discussed with Sanjeev also, Sanjeev Sabarwal, so he was also of the same opinion that it's better to do it in two stages it's a question of personal preference there are a lot of not, people who do it in not personal one only stage. i think jerry it would be wise also to me also that having two close osteot very close osteot means that might give you trouble during uh, this uh, correction even and then the vascularity associated i and think the another problem is maintaining that intraarticular correction with the illicero yeah. is also going to be a problem you you are fixing Jerry. it with screws no yeah but not always sometimes i do the stiffer osteotomy that is the intra epiphyseal intra epiphyseal osteotomy where we fix it only with the fibula graft okay. and Jerry. then once you are doing a hemiplegic elevation then your corticotomy may not remain a corticotomy it will be you may not have you will definitely have some kind of a jeopardy of the vascularity i think cherry would agree with that yeah, probably. Just two close osteotomy yeah. one for elevation and another for the corticotomy below for correction I think that might be a little closer at a single stage. Yeah, it may be a little dicey. That yes, Charis, also. The medial, the medial plateau is depressed medially as well as posteriorly. Yeah, yeah. posteriorly. So just the posterior slope. No, you elevate, you give more elevation posteriorly. You do then more. You elevate. It's a like a biplane elevation, like an oblique plane elevation. 
Yeah. So the way you elevate less elevation anterior, more elevation posterior. Yeah. So that's again one of the reasons why I prefer to do it in two stages. Shamsul, any questions from the YouTube? Professor Sa, you have any questions? Question is just one observation. I think, uh, Dr. Cherry, the case you show that the uh, recurrent, uh, the deformity recurs. So I realize it is quite similar to the case that I have. Yeah. You see the recurrence, the deformity of blouse is supposed to come from the physio plate. Yes. It grow less, lateral grow more. So the yeah. angle is actually on the top, yeah. very high. But when we do the correction, we make it straight. When it recur, it's not the deformity. It's the, the bone that we make it straight, it bend back. So the slide that I see is, is correcting, not because of the physio plate not growing and all. It is the correction that we do. It's one to go back to become deformed. So yeah. I don't know. This is like a totally a new pathology. It has its own life. Yeah. So I don't know how to correct that. But that, that age, uh, to me, I, I'm not sure that uh, the girl that you showed is how old. But uh, I notice it's about 8 to 12 years old. Older, close to skeletal maturity, they don't have this. And the younger children uh, usually don't have this. It's just around 10 years old that they just very fast go back and looks yeah. like initial Most original cool. one. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Shamsul, do we have any questions from the YouTube? Please unmute yourself. I think... There are no more questions. Do we have any more questions, Dr. Basu or Dr. Ruta? I think so we none. don't have any questions from the next sir. We don't have any more questions. Yeah. You have any questions? No. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Yeah. So I think we have had a wonderful uh, academic evening. I am really thankful to Professor Saik and Dr. Cherry being the speakers for this wonderful presentations from both of them. I'm really thankful to Dr. Ruta, Dr. Basu to have an expert opinion and Dr. Shamsul from the IOT. But uh, let me tell you that Dr. Shamsul is not only from the ortho TV, that he's basically an Elizabeth surgeon as well. So he, is, uh, he has a dual uh, role to play and it makes our things very easier. I'm really thankful to all of you making this academic event yeah. academic event very successful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Sao. Maybe we would like to have more from you in your future, inshallah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank good you. night. Thank you and good night. Good night.